Great honor here to uh, present Professor St Stefan Sanders. My title here claims, or, or maybe implies, that I do understand autism and neurodevelopment. Um, and this is true neither through genetics nor through other mechanisms. Why is this difficult? And I think this is an important message here. And I, I was inspired seeing some of the, the data you're collecting here. I think you're going to hear a common message here about this is hard, but it is a tractable problem, but it is going to require a lot of people working together. Now, in true scientific style, before you listen to me, you should think about my influences, my biases, and take that all together. So I receive funding from this group and also from these research foundations. When I started my PhD, this was the, the line I was sold. We're going to identify genes. They're going to teach us about biology. And from that, we will identify therapies. Conceptually, I think this works. We can see examples of this in the realm of cardiovascular disorders. There's lots and lots and lots of genetic risk factors. They coalesce on a number of pathways, probably more we don't know. And if you then act on those pathways, you can modify the disorder preventative and bring benefit to the individuals involved. So I was sold that as soon as we could get past this first bit, if we could just find the genes, the doors will open and finally we will understand what we're looking at. And so we're going to start off thinking about can we identify the genes underlying autism? It might not surprise you to hear the answer is going to be yes, we can find these. We start off from a great place that in autism we know from family studies that it is a highly heritable disorder, strongly implying that it is also a very genetic disorder. In fact, in this study, which was done looking at very, very large numbers of insurance records and consistently performed heritability analyses across 130 complex disorders, autism was the most heritable, the most genetic disorder out of all of those, far in excess of cancer or of hypertension or cardiovascular. This tells us that genetics is likely to be a fruitful inquiry. So we need to think about the genome. Each of us has three billion base pairs of DNA and about three million genetic variants. The majority of genetic variants are shared with other people. So if we were to take this room, we would find the vast majority, about three million of variants are common, ones which we find in more than one individual, probably two individuals in this room. And so we're going to start thinking there, can we use that huge number of common variants to identify it? To do that, you need to do a genome-wide association study. Every single dot on this plot represents one common genetic variant. If they go above that red line, you declare success and say that you've found something which meaningfully contributes towards autism. This is the latest analysis. There are two, somewhere between two and five, depending exactly how you count going above that red line, um, loci identified. That is an important success, but compared with other disorders, that is a very, very small number. So we just saw in cardiovascular genetics, and that was an outdated slide, there were 318. The reason for this is twofold. Firstly, we don't have enough samples, and that's good, something I see that we're making progress on here, and it's a really global endeavor. Secondly, in autism, each of these variants probably carries a very, very, very small effect, making it very difficult to find them. And so some evidence for that statement. If we look at a measure of how likely you are to have children, a fecundity ratio, we find that in individuals with autism, the chances of having children is quite low, something like 30%. There's a difference between males and females. So this, from the point of view of evolution or natural selection, means that any variant which has a strong effect is going to be selected out of the population and will therefore not be common. And so, that leads us to another experimental design. Why not look at the rare genetic variants? And so with a rare genetic variant, it could carry a great deal of risk because it's not had that same influence of natural selection. And the rarest of the rare variants are de novo mutations here. Each of us has 70 of them out of 3 million variants. And these are mutations which are new. They're not found in the father or the mother. They're newly arising in that child. And as a result, can carry very, very large um, amounts of risk. To identify these, we start off with families. We need both parents and a child, and ideally, an unaffected sibling control. We take the DNA. From this, we extract the coding region. 
from that, we get genetic sequence. And then we can ask the question, are there more de novo mutations in individuals with autism or in controls? And the answer we see is that yes. And this tells us that some of these de novo mutations are having a causal effect on autism. The challenge then is, which ones? Which variants are in the top bit of this bar and which ones are in the bottom bit, the neutral variation, not having any effect? To answer that question, we look at where these variants lie in the genome. Here are genes. We're looking at a region of chromosome two because it's just, it's a good region of the genome. Up here, we have de novo mutations which are scattered across those genes um, and that's because they're in controls and they just, there's no real pattern. They fall where they want. In contrast, in cases, we see some variants scattered, just like in the controls, but we also see some variants piling up in individual genes. And so here's the gene SCM2A, which is therefore um, having a causal influence on autism when there are genetic variants inside it. This concept underlies the complicated statistical approaches to gene discovery in autism. Now, I'm not going to go into those today. There's a, a very, very geeky and nerdy lecture we could talk about about the mathematics behind it. But to suffice it to say, if you can add up the number of variants versus the size of the gene, you can work out which genes are associated with autism. When you do this at scale, you can find lots of genes. And so our latest analysis of this was looking at 63,000 individuals. And these are um, defined as being in families with autism. And from that, we identify 72 genes at genome-wide significance. And that's a very, very high statistical threshold of confidence in those genes. We can add in neurodevelopmental delay, getting to about 150,000 individuals. At that stage, we get to 373 genes at the same threshold. Or we could relax the threshold, in which case we get to just north of 600. An important message for anyone who is wanting to pick a gene, the genes on this side carry a lot more effect, and therefore are like to have more dramatic effects in model systems than the genes on this side, and are also much, much more likely to um, be found in the population. So generally, if you're going to pick one gene for study, the, the left side of this is a pretty good place to start. We can ask questions about phenotype. If we identify those individuals who we find those genes with variants in, are there any difference between them and other individuals? And here we've actually slightly turned the question on its head and asked the question, are there, which phenotypes do you need to ask about to predict who you're going to find variants in? And so overall, we get to that magic number of 11.5%, you know, 12.5%. That is about the number of individuals with autism where today you can identify a robust genetic variant which is contributing risk. If you ask four questions, um, was there delay in walking over 18 months? Did they have afebrile seizures? Are they male or female, and female carrying the risk? And is there intellectual disability in IQ less than 70? From that, you can fairly well pass out the probability that you're going to identify a genetic diagnosis. And if the answer is yes to delayed walking or afebrile seizures or um, intellectual disability, there's a greater than 20% chance of finding a cause to genetic variant. And this is important as we start thinking about applying this clinically, where are we going to prioritize it? So, we can find genetic variants. That, if that, was, um, that slide is on MedArchive, uh, Bishop et al. Um, and is, is there to download. And uh, if, if journals would be nice to us, we could also get it published. <laughs> so, I hope I've shown you there that we have a really, really strong foundation in terms of identifying these genes. And so now, as I was promised, the floodgates open, everything becomes easy, and we can understand the underlying neurobiology. But a few challenges lie in the way. So let's think about exactly how this process should work. We start off with a genetic variant shown up here um, in DNA. One out of three million in that individual, three billion potential ones, but we then infer that that genetic variant somehow leads to a phenotype. Our objective then is to identify 
the causal flow by which this information takes place. Somewhere in the middle of this, there is neurobiology, pathology, etiology, something where you can see what this variant is doing, and um, that then leads to phenotype. And so we, as scientists, then have a fairly easy job. We just need to design an experiment which captures that pathology. From that, we can then develop a model system, and that should lead to therapies. Now, that's, that could be towards symptoms of anxiety, comorbidities. So long as you define your pathology and your phenotype correctly, this model should work. But my model's a little bit too simple. There are a few little bits of complicated biology in between of it. So the first one is this concept of the nucleus. And I'm showing it here like a sort of data processing system. Because to me, that's exactly what the nucleus is. Essentially, DNA is a three-dimensional biological computer whose basic role is to integrate environmental messages and messages about time, and then from that, synthesize that information into an output. And that an output is through the medium of RNA. And so this, the nucleus, is essentially a black box. We have very, very little idea how it performs this computation. To understand that, we need to really understand the non-coding genome. And so all the data I've shown you so far has been the 1% of the genome leading to genes. The other 99% is still extremely untractable. But if we could understand that, it is possible to imagine a scenario where you could predict what the nucleus does. There's also, I think, a very important point of this. The only output of the nucleus is RNA. And so at some level, if we could predict the RNA output of the nucleus, that would be a very, very good test that we understand what's going on in that information processing. But once we pass out of the nucleus with our RNA, we get to the next level of the cell. And the cell also acts like a data integration device, particularly in the case of a neuron, it takes inputs in the form of synaptic stimulation and then gives outputs, for example, in terms of neurotransmitters. And this then is the second black box where we have very, very little idea what is going on. And then just to make things more fun, we then have a third black box of the circuit. Here we enter a fun realm where I'm not even sure we can define what we mean by the word circuit. I asked a... Um, someone who, who was an expert in this field recently, and his answer was, well, the simplest thing is if you've got two cells and they interact, that is a circuit. So it's everything between two cells and I guess the entire brain. But somewhere between those two, there is, we believe, some form of data integration device which gives an output leading to behavior. And so we essentially now want to follow this red line through this. How does DNA go through these data integration pieces to lead to the phenotype at the end. To do this, we need to perform an experiment. Now, the good news is we have a causal factor at the start. Each of those 72 genes is a fantastic starting point. But similarly, we could take something like sodium valproate in a prenatal model. So we do now have causal factors which we can use as a start. And that, compared with 10 years ago, that is very exciting. However, to design our experiment, we need to firstly pick the right biological process. So in that big tower, all those three of those, we need to pick the right one. Because if you don't, you're going to get a negative result, and that does not lead to a happy career. We need to pick the right stage of development, the right brain region, the right cell type, and then also we need to pick the right thing to measure at the end of it so we get interpretal data. There's one slight problem here that we don't know a single one of those answers with any degree of confidence. And so how do you pick one of those given to, to measure, given that the other four are in flux? Now, in humans, we have a phenotype. It is a difficult one to measure. It takes a lot of time to do it. And we debate at great length whether we're doing it well. But we do have one. The challenge we have here, though, is it is very, very difficult to measure the brain. And so, essentially, we cannot see those 3D data integration pieces. Our ability to see them happening in real time is extremely limited. And so for the first two, we can basically only look through post-mortem data. And for the bottom one of the circuit, we get some insight through the level of EEG and MRI, but it's extremely, extremely coarse. 
In contrast, we have model systems. So we can take those causal factors, the genes, for example, put them into cell-based systems, organoids, mouse models, and from that, we can get very, very high resolution, real time. We can get into those difficult data integration pieces and get useful data. However, we don't have an endpoint. There is no equivalent to autism in a dish or in a mouse. I was not saying there aren't behaviors we can follow, but in terms of a community accepted surrogate endpoint to autism, something which should give us confidence, particularly when it's an answer we don't like, we just don't have it. Making things more fun, the causal path may not even exist in that post-mortem data. Because of development, all the complicated path might have taken place. Maybe all you're left with is a circuit. You cannot find the other bits going on in the data which we're using. My, my examples have a simple line. It doesn't need to be simple. If you take eye color, which surely is about as simple as genetic trait gates, even there you have a non-linear effect where the gene then acts on another gene, goes backwards to alter the cell state leading to eye color. So we should not in any way expect it's going to be linear. We should expect this information goes to the cell, back to the nucleus, to another cell, eventually integrating into a circuit, which for all we know might alter another cell type. Not only is this, like, is, is this a possibility, I think it's almost certainly going to be how it, how it works. And then, of course, these causal factors don't have to act independently. It could be that they interact. It could be you can only find them in the right situation. So, for example, if you're not looking under the right environmental exposure, the fact you've got the right causal genetic variant might be irrelevant. Things get more fun. There's not just one causal factor. I've shown you 72. I don't for a second think that that's it. So we have extensive heterogeneity. On the genetic side, we're making good progress in finding that. On the environmental side, I mean, there you can't even make an assumption of causality once you show correlation. And so we also don't have a way of measuring every single environmental factor, even better, measuring every environmental factor when the person's sort of five years old. This seems extremely difficult to find these, and then you have them, and you have this extraordinary complexity. And on the other end, these genetic variants don't simply lead to a nice compartmentalized phenotype. Sure, these genes I've identified cause autism, but I just showed you a slide saying you could predict it by age of walking. Well, that's not on the DSM criteria. Um, similarly, all the comorbidities, ADHD. So each of these genetic variants just leads to this huge amplification of the signal as it goes through this. And, and when you see it put like this, of, of course it does. And so we have multiple phenotypes for each genetic variant. And so this is what we wanted. We wanted a nice, simple model. Genetic variant, pathology, experimental system, therapy from the phenotype. This is what we got. And you put all of that together, I mean, it's just this complete mess. We don't know what experiment to perform. We don't know what to measure at the end of it. And we know that basically everything is involved. And I would argue if you pick a phenotype in a neuron and measure it hard enough, you will show <clears throat> a correlation, maybe even a causal correlation, with DNA. However, there is a way through this. Even though everything might cause everything, it doesn't do it to the same degree. So let's go back to my, to my example with cardiovascular disorders. I think it's fair to say that there are thousands and thousands of risk factors which might lead towards a heart attack. However, downstream of that, there is a coronary artery which gets blocked. Now, that's not the only cause of a heart attack. However, it's the cause in maybe 90%. There's this point where a lot of that information comes together into a single um, location. I think it is reasonable to expect something similar happening in the brain. Everything might be involved, but there are going to be bits which are more involved than others. So causality is a relative concept, not an absolute one. And I think this is fundamentally challenging to us as a group about how we're going to make progress. If you are measuring one thing, eventually you will achieve success, p-value less than 0 0.05, paper goes in, you've shown a causal link. But that doesn't mean it's the causal link, and it doesn't mean that the therapy is resulting from that to like have any effect. If, you could, if we could find a way to find these big red bars, that's what we're looking for. But to do that, you need to measure lots of things and look at the relative difference, not just the absolute difference. And that is a very, very, very big challenge. 
there are some conceptual approaches we have towards doing this. So the first one, which is maybe the easiest, is to apply convergence. And so this leverages the idea that there is some bit of this tree of information flow which has more impact than others. And so you can then ask the question, if I start off with multiple causal factors, where do they coalesce? Where's the coronary artery in, in autism? Can we see overlap between those different um, genes? An example of this might be looking at gene enrichment in single cell data, or perhaps looking at the um, influence of multiple genes on EEG signals. That, again, would potentially show a convergent signal across them. A slight caution, there is no guarantee that that convergent signature is causal. It's just more likely than the one next to it. This concept seems to be working. Now, how far it's going to go, how robust this is, I have my concerns. But we are getting some useful information out of it. Let's start off at a really high level. If I take those 72 genes and ask, what do those genes do? We see two processes coming out of it. One of them, shown here on the left in red, or the genes in purple, is gene expression regulation. So this is actually that top data integration piece. How does the nucleus work? The answer to that seems fundamental to what autism is. So there seems to be a challenge in the way that, that three-dimensional biological computer of the nucleus processes information. The second group we see is neuronal communication. So this, for example, is synapses, transporters, um, anything which gets that information between those two cells. And that's shown here as the ones in blue or the genes labeled in green. Now, interestingly, when we look at the phenotypes of the individuals in the sort of red or the blue, the gene expression versus the synaptic, we don't think we are seeing a difference. Maybe at the level of seizures, but even that is extremely vague. Largely, the two groups at the phenotype end of SRS and ADOS and ADIR seem very, very similar, to the point where, even with this information, I don't think a clinician would feel confident trying to distinguish those individuals. To me, that suggests that these two groups of genes work together. Now, that maybe is a testable thing. It's not an easy thing to test. But is there some kind of collaborative enterprise between the nucleus and the synapse which is underlying um, the, the changes we see. We can ask a question about where are the genes expressed, and that can give us some information about where we're looking. On the left, we're going to ask a very, very basic question. Do we see the genes identified in autism expressed in the muscle, the liver, the skin, or the brain? It will not surprise you to hear that the answer is the brain. Interestingly, though, the answer is only the brain for these um, synaptic genes. If we take those gene expression genes, they're actually expressed pretty much in every single tissue. We can ask a similar question about when are these genes expressed in developmental time. And so this black line here shows the, the relative expression of those genes compared with all other genes across development. And so we see that broadly the genes are expressed at a higher level early in development rather than later in development, particularly prenatally, which we could infer means that the sum of the causal process of autism takes place in utero. I would add a slight note of caution to this. Many of those genes, we're going to see in a second, those genes are expressed in neurons. There are more neurons in the, develop, in the prenatal brain than in the postnatal brain as a percentage. And so that's going to... That, sort of has to push this in this direction. And so I'm, when we first saw this signal in 2013, I was fairly convinced by it. I still agree with the, the signal. I'm less clear about the interpretation. I think we need other um, questions to answer this question about prenatal versus postnatal. For example, ultrasound seems like a good way to go. We can also ask the question about which cell types do we see these genes expressed in. So there's some new technology looking at gene expression, where now you can look at the gene expression of every single cell individually, which is just mind-blowing, science fiction stuff. So here's an example of this being done in the developing human brain. Every single dot represents a cell. They're clustered by cells which look similar because they have similar expression patterns. In the top left of this, 
we have um, where it says C25. The clusters around there, those are stem cells and neuroprogenitor cells. The bottom of it where it says excitatory lineage, that goes towards maturing and mature excitatory neurons. Inhibitory lineage on the far right, that's mature um, inhibitory neurons from it. And then we also have the glia, for example, microglia, astrocytes, and endothelia. We can then ask the question, if we take those autism genes, which of these cells are they expressed in? And the answer is, the ones in red, that it's particularly the mature and maturing excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And of all of the results we have, I think the idea that it's in the brain seems very, very clear. And then the, the idea that it's the neurons, to me, seems extremely clear at this point. That's not to say that glia aren't involved, it's just that the data are giving us a very, very, very strong signal towards excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So from this, you can see these convergent approaches do have some ability to ask these questions we're interested in. I think this field is very much in its infancy. There's a lot of need for better statistical approaches uh, to govern success, and also more widely distributed uh, data sets. One big thing we're missing at the moment is, is data from multiple regions of the human brain to ask the question which regions are involved. At, at the moment, we don't have that. So another approach is single gene studies. And the logic here is you take a gene where you have great confidence in it and then try and ask the question, what does this gene do in a model system more than other genes? And this approach has been around for a very, very long time. I think the, the conceptual problem with that is trying to find the bit which matters in this maze. And so if you're not looking everywhere and not asking the question, what does it do the most, there's a big risk of going down the wrong way. However, I still think single gene studies have a lot of value, so long as they're taken in context with other ones. Like on a single gene, and it's probably not going to surprise you that that gene is SCN2A. Um, we picked this, this gene for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, it was the first gene we found, and you know, it feels like a child at this stage, and we care about it. Um, on a more scientific note, it's the gene with the strongest evidence of association. And because that association is driven by population frequency and effect size, it seems like a logical reason to start there. But then on another scientific um, note, th the other reason to pick it is that we actually know what SCN2A does. So it's a voltage-gated sodium channel, and we can draw on 40 years worth of experiments asking what these do in neurons. And I was lucky enough to um, also be working near to Kevin Bender at UCSF, who's an electrophysiologist. And between us, we kind of had both bases covered to go and understand this gene. So we're going to learn a little bit about SCN2, to SCN2A biology, um, partly because it's fascinating, but also because it's relevant to this question about causality and the challenges of it. So SCN2A is a voltage-gated sodium channel. It encodes the channel called NAV1.2. It is a very, very important um, process. So right now, there's a decent chance you are using, well, that's, that's hmm. there's a chance that you're using this, uh, this channel to listen to this talk. And we're going to see later that the reason I hesitate slightly there, if you were infants, I would say it with absolute confidence. As an adult, for you to be engaged in this channel, I probably need to have taught you something. And I don't want to assume. <laughs> we find it um, just below the cell body at the axon initial segment, and it lives there in a closed state, not letting sodium through. When other neurons tickle this neuron and say, you know, exert neurotransmitters, that leads to a change in the resting membrane um, potential. And eventually, that change in the membrane potential is so great that NAV 1.2 opens. And at that point, um, sodium rushes into the neuron, and this causes the action potential. Milliseconds later, this fast inactivation gate, this little blue bit at the bottom, swings over and stops that process so that no more sodium comes in. And at that stage, potassium starts to leak out, causing the downward phase of the action potential. The action potential then roars down the axon to go and stimulate other neurons or muscles. And that then starts the process in the next cell. But critically, and this is the bit I hadn't, didn't know when I started this journey, it also goes up 
And this is a process called backpropagation. I can do that one more time, because I've spent a lot of time making this effect work. Um, and so that signal goes back to the dendrites. And that's critical, because that tells the dendrites and the synapses in the dendrites, good job. You did the right thing, and we fired. At the end of all of that, NEV 1.2 resets, ready to go for the next action potential. And you see this is a pretty fundamental process in the human brain. This is what the uh, channel looks like. Um, in the middle of that little star on the left, that's where the sodium goes. On the outer bit of it, um, the bits in blue, those are the voltage um, sensors. So they sit in the membrane and detect that change in membrane potential. And so once they see that change, it leads to a conformational shift, and that's how sodium goes through. To summarize and grossly simplify some complicated genetics, we find that mutations in the middle of this tend to have a loss of function effect, whereas mutations hitting that voltage sensor tend to be gain of function. Or to put it in really simple terms, the blue ones lead to less sodium and therefore fewer action potentials. The red ones lead to more sodium and more action potentials. Now what I find lovely about this is, so we talk about how complicated the brain is. I'm gonna show you an example where it isn't. It is actually really, really simple because of this channel. So there are multiple different phenotypes associated with SCN2A. Probably the most obvious one is the early onset epileptic encephalopathy. So this is a disorder which presents with seizures before the first year of life, and it is devastating. Absolutely awful neurodevelopmental outcomes. There's then a milder version of that called benign infantile seizures. The seizures present in the first year of life, but then they just go away, and there's no long-term problems. We're actually going to ignore that for the point of view of this, just because it doesn't cause a problem at this stage which needs treating. We then have another group of individuals who don't have seizures in the first year of life, but then go on to develop autism and developmental delay. And then on to a, a final group where they develop autism, developmental delay, and then after that, have a late onset form of seizures. And in this channel, we see very, very strong correlation between the impact of the mutation and the phenotype. So if you have a severe gain of function mutation, that leads to the epileptic encephalopathy, and it kind of makes sense. If you're having too many um, action potentials, that sounds like epilepsy. The benign infantile seizures are a mild gain of function, and so that's not enough to cause a long-term problem, but enough to cause a few seizures in your first year of life. On the loss of function side, those lead to autism, and a severe loss of function causes enough disruption to the, um, to the circuit that you also then sometimes get seizures on top of it. And this is clinically relevant because if it's a gain of function child, you need to give a sodium blocking anti-epileptic, whereas if it's a late onset seizure, that will make things worse. And so we talk about how complicated the brain is, but in this one channel, it's actually quite simple. And it's important to remember that even though the brain seems fantastically complicated, it probably is just lots of simple things stacked together, meaning it is tractable with enough data and enough ways forward. Just to add a little confusion here, in the middle, there's a group which are both loss and gain of function. Now, I've presented this as being all about how much sodium comes in, in which case that makes no sense at all. But an example of a mixed um, effect would be one where it's very, very, very hard to open the channel, but once you open it, it stays open. And so you not only do you have less sodium going in initially, but once it opens, there's more sodium. And so it's all about it not really working in the right context. And this, as you might predict, leads to a mixed um, effect. Seizures happening about one year of, life, of age, and interestingly, also causing a movement disorder, which doesn't replicate in the mouse. This disorder is very common, and so you're, you've talked about having 600 cases here. I would guess that if you've not seen one yet, you will in the next 600. There we go. I'll, I'll await the phone call. <laughs> it's about the same frequency as SCM1A, Dravami, um, because it's the, the, a very, very similar channel. Now, there's one more wrinkle to this. Early on, SCN2A is the only channel creating action potentials in excitatory neurons. 
And so we predict from that that if you have a loss of function effect which leads to autism, that would lead to a reduction in excitability. And that's exactly what happens. So here we are looking in a mouse. We can ask the question, how much do you need to stimulate the neuron to get an action potential? And the answer is you have to stimulate it more in the face of missing one copy of SCN2A. However, at the age of one year, SCN2A is replaced by SCN8A at the ax axon initial segment. And this has an important effect because SCN8A now takes over that role of sending, of creating the action potential and sending it forward, leaving SCN2A only with that role of sending it backwards. And this is my hesitation about whether you've learned something being important at this age, because now it's, it's only really responsible for backpropagation. And sure enough, if we take that difference in excitability, it goes away. In contrast, if we measure how, how well the action potential goes up the dendrites, so the, how good the backpropagation is by the speed of the action potential, we see that there's a deficit which starts very early and persists. We can also measure how well the synapse learns, so synaptic plasticity, through the AMPA to NMDA ratio. And so here, in this one image, we have a picture of two ways that SCN2A might act. It might be a prenatal disorder where a reduction in excitability, which then goes away, leads to a downstream change, presumably at the circuit level. Or it might be that there's a persistent reduction in the ability of a synapse to learn. So a reduction in synaptic plasticity. Or it might be both. And so we get back to this question again of needing to know the time before we can fully interpret this data to be able to make sense of the next step. Another approach to this would be to essentially abandon phenotypes and use a biomarker instead. If we could find a really, really good biomarker, we could use that in model systems, and actually this whole thing would become fairly tractable to normal experimentation. Not to say it'd be easy, but it would be tractable. I'm gonna present some slightly, um, I guess, upsetting data on the search towards a biomarker. So I recently worked um, with Mara on doing a systematic review, trying to find autism biomarkers. We identified over a thousand autism biomarker papers, but we focused on 280 autism response biomarker, where the biomarker varies the symptom severity, which would be what you would need to make sense of a model system. We found that there had been 846 different molecules had been assessed across those 280 papers. But the vast majority in the top right had been assessed by one paper and one paper alone. Not the same paper, but just as in each one had been looked at in one paper. This shows a map about whether they were assessed more than once. And we can see there's a group on the right in blue, which is largely to do with immune response. And then a group on the right, which is a mixture of vitamins and minerals, um, some metals in there, and then also glutathione, which sticks out. But looking across all of this, we didn't find a single example of a really reliable biomarker where we saw consistent results across these. We can do the same on the non-molecular side, where we see some relating to EEG at the bottom, a large amount relating over here to um, functional MRI. There's maybe some evidence of cohesion on the functional MRI side on the connectivity literature, but it's very, very hard to compare between the papers um, in understanding is it the same signal being seen across those. And so broadly, at the end of looking at 280 papers, 940 individual biomarkers, the answer is no. We don't, at this stage, have a reliable biomarker. And I want to give the message here about why the answer to that is no, because that's an enormous amount of work to be able to say that we didn't find anything at the end of it. This figure at the top shows the size in number of individuals of all of those 280 sample studies. And you can see that the median there is about 70. At the bottom is a power calculation, asking the question, should you be able to find a biomarker based on the size of effect? So on the purple line, that's a dramatic effect. I mean, that would be like a coincidence of two. The yellow line is, um, is a large effect, the gray is medium, and then small is over there in green. And so if we believe this, 
then each one of those studies should have been powered to identify a large effect biomarker. And actually, some of the bigger ones should have a fairly good go at finding a medium effect biomarker, in which case you would expect replication, but we didn't see evidence of replication. But here's the problem with that. There's 940 biomarkers, and you can't look at each one in isolation. And this was a lesson we got from the genetic era. In the era of candidate gene studies, where we focused on gene by gene, none of the data replicated and the sample sizes were small. It was only once we moved on to exome studies and looked everywhere and then looked in vast sample sizes that we saw very, very clear replicating robust findings. If we do the Bonferroni correction on this, we can see that these studies are no longer powered even to identify a large effect biomarker. And I think the idea of a dramatic effect biomarker is really quite unlikely in, in our field. And so the simple reason these failed is that they are all, or most of them, are too small. So as we do this, and I think this is true really for anything involving human samples, we need to strive towards big sample sizes where when we see a result, not only is it robust, but we can believe it when it's a surprising result. Because there's no way I would have picked CHD8 as being one of the leading causes of autism before we did that experiment. And I'd like to end on an on a optimistic note, of, but another way of thinking this through. Another way to show that you're on the right path of causality is to, ident is to modify it through a therapy. Now, of course, this is a little bit tautological because I started off by promising you this was a route towards a therapy. So telling you that I'm going to start with a therapy to actually work out the neurobiology as, as maybe a little disingenuous, but conceptually, if you could modify it, that tells you something about how that information flow is taking place. And we are at an interesting era, because for the first time in human history, we actually have the tools to do this for some of these disorders. So particularly the single gene disorders, right now, they seem tractable in a way they didn't, even five years ago. So here's an example of a, of a new method called CRISPR-A, CRISPR activation. And this was um, pioneered by uh, Nadav and Navneet at UCSF. And the way this works is it uses the CRISPR gene editing tool. Instead of editing the gene, it activates the gene. Now remember, in SCN2A, the problem was that we're missing one copy. If you could activate that other copy, you would now have the equivalent amount of RNA of two copies. And so in theory, if you could activate almost all of these 72 genes to bring it to two copies, you have something which looks like a genetic rescue and maybe a therapy. This is an example, which their first example, which was done with a disorder like that called SIM1. SIM1 leads to obesity. And you can see the mouse on the left, which is obese, and the mouse on the right, which has been treated by this, a single dose of this CRISPR-A therapy, leads to a mouse, which is now a normal size. Working with Nadav and Kevin and, um, and Navneet, we've been working on CRISPR-A in SCN2A. A single injection of a virally delivered CRISPR-A um, into the tail vein of the mouse, shown on the left, leads to widespread expression of that CRISPR-A product throughout the brain, shown in the middle, though you might just have to believe me on that one. And then on the right, remember the synaptic plasticity deficit in SCN2A. So we saw in blue that the heterozygous state led to a deficit in that peak, uh, in that speed of the action potential in the back propagation. If we give the CRISPR-A, shown in purple, it rescues that. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a behavioral phenotype in this model, but we're in the middle of looking at the question of seizure susceptibility to show that that rescue there of the back propagation and of the synaptic plasticity could have an impact on the seizure threshold. And this is critically important because if we could rescue it, and if we could then rescue it in a human child, and we saw improvement of symptoms, that gives you a very, very clear answer to that question about when is autism happening. Not a definitive answer, but at least an answer about when, if there's still plasticity in the system which could be treated. And so the question then is getting it into humans, and right now, there is a trial going on with an antisense oligonucleotide in Angelman syndrome, which is UBE3A. And this gives a small amount of modified DNA intrathecally, so into the spine every three months. And it's been given to a small number of children aged 4 to 18. 
This is anecdotal. It's an open source study. There are no controls. However, it's the opinion of the clinicians involved in it and of the parents that this is having a fairly dramatic effect. Not by any stretch a cure, but it is leading to improvements in um, children's ability to engage in day-to-day -day activities. And so from this, we are on an era where it is possible to modify some of these single gene disorders. And that might give us even more information about this question about when, where, and how autism takes place. And so to end, we started off with the question, could we find the genes associated with the disorder? Over the last 10 years, the answer to that's become yes. At this stage, it really is just continuing doing what we're doing at bigger and bigger scales, bringing more partners in together to get a really, really good list of genes involved. It might be that we need a very, very long list because the length of that list is going to be helpful in thinking of causality. The next question, can we find biology associated with the disorder? There are some things we can say with confidence. It does seem to be in the brain. We can say also that its excitatory <clears throat> and inhibitory neurons are involved. I'm not saying it's only them, but they are definitely involved. It is less clear when it happens in development. <clears throat> I think you can still argue early versus late. I obviously am hoping for late because that suggests more of a modifiable phenotype. We can say that gene expression and the synapse are involved. That's not to say they're the only ones, but those certainly seem to be major players in the process. And there's a lot of smoke around the idea that maybe synaptic plasticity is um, a major part of this process. And then finally, moving over towards therapies, I think there are important questions about exactly what we are trying to treat, but certainly in the single gene disorders, <clears throat> where the symptoms are devastating, it does seem possible to modify some of the symptoms later in life with uh, cutting edge gene therapies. And as a last thought, I showed the challenge of causality. The simple answer to this is we need to think big. We need to be thinking globally. We need to be thinking about multiple different metrics in the same pa um, patients. And we need to have big sample sizes where you get robust results. And I think that hopefully is a message which echoes with this institution, with what you're trying to achieve here. And I'm very, very grateful that you're already reaching out internationally because this really is a, a global endeavor. And so I'm going to end with thanking all the wonderful people who I have the pleasure of working with and also the foundations who provided funding. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sure. So um, I presume people at the back could not so, so if I may summarize, <clears throat> the question I think simply is, what do common variants bring to the table? Like, do they help with the science? Do they help with the clinic? Is that, is that a fair summary? <laughs> there we go. Um, so in, in the cardiovascular realm, there are fewer rare variants and far more common variants. Um, there are, it is, it is probably just at the step where measuring those common variants in an individual is clinically useful in terms of determining who is going to go on to get a, uh, who should get blood pressure therapy, who should get a statin. Um, but it is, it is very much, it's not been implemented in clinics, partly driven by, because it's not that useful yet, but it will be in the not too distant future. In autism, I think there are two situations where it helps. The first one is, um, that idea of convergence is limited by the number of genetic variants or, gen or genes going into it, and, and particularly by how different those genes are to each other. So the longer that list is, the better. I've recently seen some work done by like Christian Brennan and Elise Robinson, um, looking at the idea of looking at multiple different cells in a dish and measuring things like regulatory regions in DNA. And using that concept of the, of the common variant scores to essentially map the, the vulnerability regions of the, of the genome. 
which allows them to ask very sophisticated questions about, let's say I stimulate the neurons. Do I see a stronger enrichment with stimulation or not with stimulation? That's the sort of thing you can actually measure with common variants. And so I'm, I'm relatively sold, and it essentially applies some of the metrics of common variant heritability studies into a in-dish model or an organoid model. And so I think in terms of the power of, of being able to make sense of this in a human model and also under, underlying the underlying polygenicity, I'm actually fairly convinced that common variants have a role to play. It, we won't see it first in autism because you know, with th five, you can't really do much. But in schizophrenia, I think we're starting to see meaningful progress there. In the clinic, I am less sure. Um, right now, I, I think, I mean, we're still at the stage where it's a clinical diagnosis. And it's not knowing that it's maybe sort of a 2% increase in genetic risk. I don't think meaningfully changes, and probably shouldn't meaningfully change that. It's possible that in 30 years' time, there is a polygenic risk score in autism, which might be of utility. But even then, we're going to have problems about in which populations and in which scenarios it is. And I think the last thing there is, there is very, very limited, why create a predictive measure when you don't have a reaction to prediction? And this is the problem with schizophrenia. If someone could tell me that this patient in two years' time is going to develop schizophrenia, I'm not sure clinically we'd do anything differently. And certainly in autism, maybe we might try and give more language support, but we don't even know that that would make a difference. So I think that whole, we need a whole era of preventative mental health disorders before we can even begin to make sense of common variants in the clinic. But they are, they are important. Yeah, and I say this as a rare variant geneticist. I'm, I'm meant to be sort of arguing and saying, my common variant friends, you know, the complete waste of time, you should give all the money to us rare variant. But it's not true. It's, it's the unification of the two. And if, if we've learned anything, it's that both play an important role in autism. Thank you. Well, we are out.